Okay. Okay. There we go. Just turn it on now. All right. So uh, my presentation today is going to be about a biopsychosocial perspective on the phenomenon of dreaming. And I'm going to be taking a close look at some different angles on dreams and why we have them and what they can mean and really hopefully um, making you think a little bit differently about this phenomenon that really happens to every single person um, on Earth. So just to start off, uh, this is a quick question, and I guess the best way to approach it would be to just think about it in your head. But what, how much time will you spend dreaming in one complete lifetime? And the answer is actually very surprising. A total of six years of dreaming when you add up all of the time, which is kind of a crazy amount. And in my mind, that really begs the question, well, what can we do with all this time that we're spending in a dream state and why is it important? A uh, quote I'm going to read quickly, and we're going to keep referring back to this quote, actually, um, to try to um, get at a bunch of different angles, um, is the key to growth is the introduction of a higher level of consciousness into our awareness. And that was by Lao Tzu, a Chinese philosopher. Um, so as I said, I think this is a very powerful quote, and I'm going to be keep, I'm going to tie it in in a bunch of different ways as we go along. So in the very beginning, dreams and history um, the Babylonians and Egyptians, um, and they're around before 500 BC, dreams um, to them were kind of a way to tell the future and they kind of carried a divine meaning. So they are very, very respectful of dreams and their meanings. Um, you can think of this um, Joseph uh, and the Technicolor Dream Code and how that was such an important, um, how he became such an important character in that story because of his dream telling abilities. And then later Aristotle in 350 BC, who actually believed, started to believe them to be a psychological phenomena and um, actually carry some um, meaning behind them scientifically. So first we're gonna start right off with the biological perspective. Um, so this is really where I'm gonna look at why we dream and the real nitty gritty of it. So first, um, as you're sleeping, the journey to a dream, uh, the first stage, uh, as you're falling asleep, imagine you're just getting back, um, you're getting into your bed, you're starting to relax a bit, you're going to have a few minutes of really light sleep. Um, your heartbeat and your breathing and eye movement is really going to slow down. You might have some muscle twitches um, and a few slow brain waves. Uh, second stage, you're going to relax even more. Um, your body temperature actually drops and your eye movement is becoming very slow and your brain activity is slowing down. Third stage is continuing along this trend even deeper. Um, heartbeat, and your heartbeat and your breathing is, very sl is slowing down immensely. Um, and you're very hard to awaken at this point. It's um, kind of the deepest level of sleep right before REM. And the fourth and last stage is rapid eye movement. And REM sleep is um, kind of, some will say, the most important part of sleep because um, it's really where we have all this activity going on in our mind and all of these um, neurons firing. And, and actually, there's no information coming in during REM sleep. And so your muscles actually become paralyzed at this point. Um, and your heartbeat picks up to actually normal levels and your brain waves are actually at normal levels as if you are awake once again, which is very interesting. And this is where um, most dreams occur. So in the image here, you can see um, a cycle of an entire night. These four stages cycle on and off throughout sleep. Um, it's not just um, one through four once and then you're done. Um, so REM sleep, actually the first stage happens about 90 minutes into falling asleep and then continues to get longer and longer throughout the night. Um, so this is, this is really the period where you are having dreams. So you tend to remember them more if you wake up straight from a REM sleep. So biologically, what's a biological explanation for why we dream? First, of course, is an evolutionary um, necessity. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then after that, the activation synthesis um, biological theory. So interest, interestingly enough, um, there's, there's a theory out there that says that we dream actually because of our eyes and because specifically that our eyes need oxygen even when they're sleeping. And this actually brings in this idea of an evolutionary advantage to why we developed this skill, you might say, of dreaming. So, and it also begs the question why the fetuses experience REM sleep. Well, they have eyes. And so this having eyes, um, it requires us to have sleep. Um, specifically because of a liquid called the acri aqueous humor. And aqueous humor is um, a fluid in your eye that carries oxygen to the cornea of the eye. Um, and when you're awake, that really happens through eye movement and blinking, um, continuously bringing that oxygen in. But when you fall asleep, your eyes are closed. So that actually would mean that this um, fluid is no longer moving as much. And so 
your eyes still need that oxygen. And so how is it going to get that oxygen? Well, rapid eye movement during REM sleep actually moves this fluid um, and thus brings this oxygen back to your cornea. And otherwise, um, you would eventually become starved of oxygen in your eyes while you sleep. And of course, waking up to no longer being able to see is not something that would benefit, um, benefit an organism early in life as it's evolving into something greater. So eventually, um, eventually humans would, or animals would develop this need to have the REM sleep. And from that, um, stemming dreams as the movement of the eyes necessary to make this fluid move um, leads to brain activity and brain activity leads to dreaming. So the activation synthesis theory um, also relates to um, biology as um, during REM sleep, there's not really any new info coming in. Your body is still, your muscles are paralyzed, and there's this sensory blockage. And sleep paralysis is actually what um, you call um, your muscles being paralyzed. And sometimes people have experiences of waking up during sleep paralysis, which is a scary thing. But basically during this time, um, neurons are actually still firing in your brain and sending um, these electrical signals all over and there's a lot of chemical transmissions. And because of this um, and these random neuron activities, um, your, your brain actually needs to try to make sense of this activity. It, um, it needs to kind of have, um, it needs to figure out in its own um, way um, why this activity is happening and um, the product would then be dreams as it's making sense of these neurons and trying to um, find a reason behind, yeah, and then it, this would lead to the dream content and specifically, um, depending on the neurons that are firing, what would happen in your dream. Um, so this is a quick video. I don't know if the sound will play, but I will describe it if it does and not. She sees a crab and her color starts to change a little bit. And then she turns all dark. Octopuses will do that when they leave the bottom. This is a camouflage. Like she's just subdued a crab and now she's um, going to sit there and eat it. And she doesn't want anyone to notice her. It's a very unusual behavior to see the color come and go on her mantle like that. I mean, just to be able to see all the different color patterns just flashing one after another. And you don't usually see that when an animal is sleeping. It really is. So this video um, is actually very interesting because um, it's specifically showing an animal dreaming. And a lot of the time, um, we, we tend to think of dreams as something specific to humans. And yet um, here you see animals dreaming and an octopus similar to a human um, does have that eye structure. So that connects back to that theory of the aqueous humor and um, those neurons firing. So it's a very cool image, I think, to be able to see um, as those colors are changing, you can kind of get grasp um, some of the content possibly of what this octopus is dreaming about. And it's, you can see that it's a phenomenon present in all animals. So some neurology of dreams and the exact parts of the brain that are awake during the dream I'm going to discuss now. Um, so the cerebral cortex, um, this really uh, so works with the awareness and logic, memory, consciousness, day-to-day um, -day activities, and really, um, really just your thinking throughout the day. Um, thalamus is, um, processes short-term memory, um, communicates sensory feeling, and um, just anything that you can gain from your surroundings by touch or smell. And the amygdala processes emotions, so anxiety and fear. Um, and once again, a lot of these uh, brain functions work together um, to create uh, what you perceive every day. It's not necessarily one or the other, but these are some of the key functions and some of the parts very important to dreams because specifically the thalamus is actually very active during a dream, um, which makes sense even though you're not moving. When you're in a dream, you feel like you are touching things and you feel like you're experiencing things. And similarly, the amygdala is also very present in a dream because you have those intense emotions and you can feel scared if it is a scary dream or you can have um, anxiety depending on the situation. However, the cerebral cortex is not active during dreams. And because of that, you have this lapse in awareness and often logic. That's why sometimes you're in a dream, you have no idea because usually the part of your brain that would sense, well, this doesn't make sense. Why am I flying? Is not, is not aware. So you're kind of sitting there just stuck in this dream, um, thinking, of course, it's normal and you think it's reality and you don't have that consciousness. 
So next I'm going to talk a little bit about the psychological perspective of dreaming. So what exactly are dreams made of? So first I'm going to talk a little bit about the subconscious. And so the subconscious, the, I mean the conscious, the conscious, um, as I mentioned before, um, is centered really in that cerebral cortex and all of that awareness and logic decision making. And also that mobility as you're physically making decisions as you go about your day. And that higher complex thought that you're very aware of. However, the subconscious um, actually is called the waiting room to the, to the unconscious, um, as psychologists would say, because um, the unconscious really are things that you can't control, um, instincts, intuitions, but the subconscious is that waiting room of all of these emotions that are kind of oppressed, um, kind of drifting between that conscious thought and the unconscious thought. Um, so, as I said before, unconscious is that memory instinct. And actually, subconscious makes up um, the stuff of our dreams. So, um, a lot of the time when we are in a dream, it's really being inside of our subconscious, which is very interesting. If you think of the subconscious as the imagination, um, it's not um, your imagination being inside you. You're kind of going inside your imagination, which is um, a very um, abstract thought, but it actually explains it pretty well. So the life, uh, the subconscious and daily life. So first I'm going to do um, a quick little um, game. Um, just try to, um, don't overthink it at all. I'm going to ask a few questions and in your head, um, try to picture um, the thing that I'm asking about. Just very picture it. If you need to close your eyes, that's fine too. Um, and then I'm going to ask a question at the end and hopefully um, it proves my hypothesis. So the first question is, um, what does a first place ribbon look like? So really picture it in your head. I know it's simple, but. Picture everything about it, the colors, the shape. And next, uh, from Finding Nemo, can you visualize Dory? And um, in your head, how many oceans are there on the globe? Imagine the globe, try to remember how many oceans there are. Okay, so the last question I'm gonna ask now is think of a, just a random color. First thing that pops into your mind, now this may not work for everyone, but um, statistically, most people should have picked blue. And the reason behind that is something called subconscious priming. So an experiment was done in 2004 at Stanford University by Aaron Kay, and it actually proved that sensory alterations can subconsciously affect outcomes. So for example, a temperature affected subjects' perception of strangers. Um, so as in when they, walk, when they were meeting someone for the first time and it was a cold environment, they actually were more likely to think of that person as more cold versus if it was a warmer environment, which is very interesting. And similarly, presence of items such as briefcases increasing competitive intensity um, in subjects during business um, transactions. So this is another very interesting thing because you're not physically thinking, um, you don't really decide to be more competitive but because your subconscious is perceive, or it's perceiving these things around you, it's, very, it's priming your mind to react to a situation in a certain way. And similarly, the scent of cleaning fluid, increasing the probability of subjects cleaning up after themselves. And so furthermore, um, this idea of subconscious priming um, came up in a study um, published by Nature Neuroscience. And they actually found that um, using brain scanners, they could predict people's decisions um, a significant amount of time before they saw them consciously make them. So they, had, they were able to see um, the brain scans and see the different parts of the brain and the conscious decision-making area fired after this other um, area of the brain. And so they actually started to realize this had this theory that subconscious brain activity precedes conscious determination. And so tying this all back to um, the guessing game, um, Oh, what was supposed to happen is as you're thinking of these items, um, Dory or the oceans, uh, they're all blue items, right? So as you're imagining them in your mind, um, you're, um, you're kind of focusing your thoughts on all of these blue items. And then some, hopefully without even knowing it, at the end, you tended to pick the blue color. And so this also begs the question, um, free will versus subconscious brain activity. And it's not to say that, it's not to say that um, there's no such thing as free will. However, um, we do need to put thought into how much um, our subconscious can actually affect our decision making. And um, similarly, why should we pay more attention to our subconscious um, because of that? And why should we pay more attention um, to doing things that are going to prime our subconscious in the right way? 
your decisions are strongly prepared by, sub by subconscious brain activity by the time consciousness kicks in, most of the work has already been done. So this ties right back to that idea of having um, a subconscious level of thinking that actually affects most of your day-to-day -day life. So what exactly does this mean? Well, as I explained before, um, this um, is a bottom-up decision-making theory. So your de deeper subconscious is really weighing in on situations before affecting your conscious thought. And as I said before, it doesn't necessarily mean free will does not exist, but it means that your subconscious is a very powerful thing. And because of that, it's something that we should be examining um, very thoroughly and we should be thinking about and being aware of day to day. All this information that we're taking in, we should be aware of it because it's going to affect decisions in the future, even if we don't know. Uh, and so guided mindfulness and guided imagery is kind of a form of um, using the subconscious um, the stuff that makes up our dreams actually in daily life to make us perform better. And guided imagery basically is when um, before you are performing or doing something, you imagine very deep in a very detailed manner in your mind what um, is going to happen and you imagine yourself carrying out the actions and you imagine yourself doing everything in a very detailed manner. And this can actually lead to changes when you actually do do the action. Um, a very interesting book, um, The Body Has a Mind of Its Own, um, discusses this exact thing and how athletes use gutted imagery prior to performing and it can increase their awareness, it focuses their mind on the skills they're doing and it makes them more connected to their body. You're priming your mind to be ready for what you're going to do next. And it also has been used to treat Parkinson's, which is interesting. And so how could you apply this to daily life? Well, um, we just have to keep in mind that the subconscious is a powerful thing. So everything we're doing throughout our day um, is accumulating into um, our thoughts and it's accumulating into the makeup of our subconscious and our unconscious and so it can affect um, decisions we make in the future. Your subconscious is the physio physiological substance in which your personality and wishes and desires operate. So as I said before, um, the, your subconscious is really the set is made up of your personality. So as you're making decisions on um, this kind of it, these instinctual decisions are made based on your personality. And so I guess the question to ask then is what is your personality made of? How do you create your personality if your personality is creating your decisions? So I think um, this quote uh, ties very perfectly to this and the idea of um, subconscious and making sure you prime your subconscious, you might say, in the right way um, to have the best and fullest life. So watch your thoughts for they become words. Watch your words because they become actions. Watch your actions. They become habits. Watch your habits. They become your character and watch your character, it becomes your destiny. And this is that idea of day-to-day -day life and mindfulness about um, everything you're taking in um, about the world is very much going to affect your decisions in the future. It's going to affect what um, makes up your subconscious and so it's gonna affect your conscious decisions in the future. And once again, I wanna tie this back to the quote that I mentioned in the beginning that the key to growth is the introduction of a higher level of consciousness into our awareness. And as we become more conscious about um, the things we are doing and, um, and our subconscious priming, um, then we're going to grow even more as human beings. So psychologically, so an explanation for dreaming um, is this theory of compensation theory of dreams. And so Freud was a very, um, he was a very important character. He did a lot of work um, on dreams. Um, he had, he had, there was many issues with his work. Um, uh, he was, there was some sexist um, controversy, but all in all, he had some very interesting theories and that brain processes experiences and repressed emotions. So things throughout the day that um, we kind of repress and we, that we try not to think about either because they're, um, they might be a little bit controversial or they might be something that we think is wrong to think about, or it might be something that's too scary or too um, anxiety inducing to think about. These are the things that come up in our dreams. There, as the repressed emotions are released once more back um, into the consciousness as we dream, um, this subconscious, the stuff of all of these repressed emotions are coming to the surface. And that's why we have a lot of um, dreams that, are, that can be based on fear or other um, strong, intense emotions. And similarly, humans strive for balance. Um, so physically and mentally, and as we dream, um, we kind of reach this homeostasis of all the things we're repressing coming to the surface to balance us out. An expression of repressed tendencies has the effect of getting rid of conflict in the personality, and that ties right back to the idea of homeostasis and coming to um, a mental equilibrium. She believed in dreams, all right, but she also believed in doing something about them. So this is a Cinderella quote, which I thought 
um, fit very nicely with my next section. So um, what can we do with our dreams? Because they are powerful things. And uh, I'm not talking about the Cinderella genes, of course. Now I'm taking this back into um, actual physical dreams um, that we have every night and what can we do with them. So dream interpretation for psychological treatment. So the first thing I wanna examine is the Freudian iceberg. So Freudian iceberg. So the waking life um, and the conscious um, is this tip of the iceberg where we have our focus, our attention, thoughts, current awareness. And then underneath that, we have this base of the iceberg, which um, is actually even more massive than the tip that we see and we are aware of every day. And that's the subconscious and the unconscious. So these repressed emotions, instincts and stored memories. And so since this is such a great makeup of our mental state, it's really important to um, be able to examine um, what they are. And since the subconscious really comes into being during our dreams, it's important to examine what our dreams are and what happens during them. So symbolic nature of dream interpretation. So can specific symbols mean certain things? Um, can spiders or numbers or colors really mean specific things when you're having a dream? And to some extent, um, to some extent they can, and to some extent they cannot. It's a very subjective um, thing, and it varies per person. Um, as Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. So not every single thing that happens in dream has some powerful um, emotion, has some powerful meaning. But um, the most important thing to remember is that it's not really the objects themselves, but how the objects are in your dream and how the situation relates to you. For example. Um, this is uh, something um, that is commonly um, a house, um, for example, um, with open windows, it's sunny, often it can be a representation of the self. The feelings surrounding this house are light and open, and it's feeling good, and it's feeling positive. And so sometimes this can symbolize, of course, your emotions currently in life and um, just that positivity. Um, but what about, think about a car. Now, does a car necessarily mean a specific thing? You see a car and it means, um, it means that you feel in control in life. Well, it, can, it doesn't always mean that because, um, for example, if you're in the car, what if you're not driving? What if you're in the backseat? Well, then that could symbolize being out of control. Um, what if um, you're in the car, someone else is on your, or you're, and you're feeling, feeling very fearful? Well, that could mean another thing entirely. So both of these images show that it's not necessarily an object themselves, but the way the object is and how it's happening in your dream that becomes important and how you can relate that back to you. Um, so there's two things that are very important are latent content versus manifest content. And this deals with the fact that some things in your dream are um, very specific, like an item or a color that's very obvious. And yet the, um, there's other content in your dream that um, is the meaning behind it. And it's the symbolism that you can take away and the meaning that you can take away to then translate into um, something that can really have an effect on you and that you can interpret or understand in a way deeper than you did before. So a lot of the time um, in psychological treatment, dream journals are very important. I'm gonna talk about those later too. Um, dream journals um, help you really improve your dream recall and also look back into dreams in the past. So first, the biggest thing that, is, that happens when dream interpretation is used is asking the patient themselves, what do they think it means? Because a lot of the time, as I said before, dream inter interpretation is not about um, generic symbols, but it's about what the dream means to the person experiencing the dream. And a lot, sometimes um, if someone's experienced trauma, um, the dream actually provides access to feelings that they've been repressing. So it helps them understand a part of themselves more that they've been trying to hold back or hide. And they're able to understand them um, a little bit more and have a better perspective on the self, which really, all in all, that's what dream interpretation is geared towards. And once again, the key to growth is in the introduction of a higher level of consciousness into our awareness. And by dream interpretation, we get a new dimension of this awareness and a new way um, to understand ourselves and thus grow. So a little, a quick social perspective. So 50% of the people we dream about are actually not people we know, um, which is very interesting. And I actually think that shows the powerful, the power of your mind to be able to create people out of nothing and create faces that um, you may never have seen before. But in terms of people you do know in dreams and when you see them, they can have many different meanings. For example, um, if you see friends or family members, sometimes this can represent characteristics of yourself. Um, so um, one psychologist, Carter Stout, said, if you dream about a close friend, then um, and you think about their strongest character traits. And if you dream about them being humble, then 
you're actually dreaming about yourself, um, the humble side of yourself, um, which is very interesting. And it kind of shows dreams are very self-centered, um, which makes sense because it's your mind creating it. Um, and then what about old relationships, friends and family? Sometimes um, this can simply be due, because, due to something that surfaced during, throughout the day, even if you weren't aware of a person reminding you of them. Once again, all of these repressed thoughts and just all of these things that linger in your mind you aren't even, con you aren't even um, conscious of. Um, a loss of a person in a dream can sometimes represent losing a part of yourself or anxiety about losing that person, that fear. And dreaming about being chased by another person is actually very interesting. Um, because sometimes it can mean that you're ignoring a truth in your own life. Once again, it's the emotions that you're getting as you're being chased is what ties it back to the thing happening in your life that the dream relates to. So that feeling of anxiety is something that's chasing you as you're running away um, is similar to what you might feel, that lingering feeling as you're ignoring something, uh, truth in your own life or having anxiety about something in your daily life. And some quick, um, some quick statistics and um, gene variations within populations. So depressed patients actually have lower dream recall. Um, and there's many theories about why this is, but it's actually um, a very interesting thing to think about. And 52% of veterans with PTSD have nightmares um, versus 3% of civilians. And anxi um, anxiety often leads to longer and more vivid dreams um, because uh, people with anxiety have very high um, brain activity, they're taking in a lot of information, so it actually leads um, to them having these more intense dreams. And actually, in bipolar patients, dreams can actually predict oncoming shifts in their mental states as they um, shift between highs and lows. They can act, dreams can actually um, suggest that there's a shift, um, an onset of a different positive or negative period in their life. So bringing all of this into daily life. 50% of content of dreams um, is lost within five minutes. So when you wake up, I'm sure very few of us remember every single one of our dreams, and that's because um, that long-term memory is very inhibited, so we forget a lot of our dreams so quickly. So the question that we have to ask is, how can we remember more of these dreams? How can we, we improve that dream recall? So dream, um, dream journal, journaling is a huge way that we can do this. Um, and actually, just the idea of committing your mind to remembering more makes you remember more. So I have um, two of my dreams here. Um, they actually both are a little bit of a negative dream, but I swear not all of my dreams are negative. These I just thought were very interesting in accordance with periods, things that were going on at the time in my life. Um, so this um, first dream, um, relating back to this idea of the self being a house, this one actually was the opposite of that. So I had a dream actually about um, being in a mansion filled with these goblin-like goblin figures. I didn't know exactly what they were, but I remember feeling kind of like they weren't supposed to be there. Um, and so I knew I had to get rid of them. And keep in mind, bear with me, some of these memories will be a little bit choppy. I don't have perfect dream recall <laughs> as well. So this is just some of the main points that I remembered. So I remember searching for a matchbox and somehow having this idea in my mind that, well, if I burn the house down, it would get rid of all of these bad people. Um, and so the house was burning in the end. And when I first went back to look at this dream um, in my dream journal, at first I was a little alarmed thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not dreaming about a sunny open windowed house. I'm dreaming about a burning house. What could that mean? <laughs> but I actually saw some very interesting ties. So, um, oh, actually note um, the date at the top there, 1419 should be 1420. Um, so this was actually happening um, right um, in the middle of, um, a big decision that I was actually making in my life, and um, this decision was actually to um, stop playing a sport that I had been doing for many years, and um, there were a lot of things weighing on me about it. There was some um, physical and mental stresses um, that were kind of aiding in my decision, but it was, a, it was a very stressful thing for me, and it was something that I was removing from my life that um, I knew that was hard for me. It was a hard decision to make, but at the same time, I knew it was best for me. Um, and so I actually started thinking to myself, well, um, this house, what could it represent? It could represent me um, removing a part of my life or having this stress-filled um, environment and feeling like I knew I had to um, make a change um, that was physically going to be better for me. Um, and I did one consolation I thought in my mind as well. I was the one who set the house on fire, <laughs> at least. It wasn't just burning on its own. But um, so, that, so I thought that that was very interesting. And then another dream I had later on, um, so this one I was actually, 
um, skydiving. And um, I actually, I wasn't feeling any, I wasn't feeling scared at all, but I was um, parachuting and I parachuted into the water the first time. And then I went to jump again and I realized my parachute was not strapped on. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, I didn't feel immediate panic. I didn't feel um, scared or stressed. I wasn't thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. I just remember thinking, well, I'm going to have to hold on to this parachute. I'm going to have to hold on to these straps of the parachute really hard because it's up to me now to make sure I get to the ground safely. And actually, um, around this time, for those of you who know about the college application process, this is the period in between uh, applying to college and finding out whether you got in. So it's, I think this connected perfectly with my dream because it was this idea of um, this uncertainty and kind of feeling out of control. Like I didn't, I wasn't in a um, comfortable place because I didn't know where I was going to school. I didn't know where I was going to get in, if I was going to get in, what was going to happen. And similarly, I was on this brink of moving on to a new period in my life and coming to a new um, place and kind of stepping out on my own. And well, it was going to be up to me to define my life. So just as I was having to hold on to those parachute straps and know that it was me um, going to make the difference between um, the outcome, um, so was the period in my life of um, knowing that it was going to be me venturing out and creating my own, my own life. So going back to this idea of the neurology of dreams. So as I said, most, in, in most of the time in dreams, we have no idea that it's a dream. We're, we're in that dream and we believe it's reality. We can't remember anything that came before, after, not at all. But what if we could change that? What if the cerebral cortex, that awareness, that logic could come to life? And what if we could become aware in a dream? What would happen then? So um, Stephen LeBurge um, is a scientist and he did a very interesting experiment that actually proved that this phenomenon is possible. And so he tracked eye movement and sleep um, with a bunch of subjects. And he actually asked them, he said, um, I, these subjects who had a track record of being able to become conscious, become lucid in the middle of a dream, he said, I want you to blink twice when you're in a dream because your eye movements in a dream actually parallel with your physical eye movements while you're sleeping. So he had, these, he had them go in and they laid down um, and these subjects blinked when they came awake. And this one specific man blinked, he came awake, but then they saw him blink again because they were supposed to blink once they thought that they had woken. But the, the subject hadn't actually come awake. He had had what they call a false awakening. And then so eventually when the subject did come to consciousness for, for real, um, he woke up um, in the lab. They asked him what happened. And the subject said, well, I, I woke up in a dream. I knew it was a dream. So I blinked to tell you it was a dream. And then I dreamed that I was waking up in the lab. So I thought, oh, I'm, I'm awake. So I blinked to tell you that I was now awake again. And this, this rough scientist came over to me and and he ripped the electrodes off my head. And I, I thought to myself, well, that's bold. That's not the correct procedure. Maybe I'm still dreaming, which was the case. So then he blinked again to tell them he was actually in a dream. And all in all, what this experiment proves is that um, lucid dreaming can occur. Um, so 51% of people have had spontaneous lucid dreams once in their life. And 20% have one about once a month. And why is this possible? So biologically, this is possible because of the shifts in neurons that occur. Some people tend to have a higher frequency of certain um, neurotransmitters. Um, so natural plethora of um, these neurotransmitters, such as um, acetylcholine, I'm probably saying that wrong, but um, it makes switching on consciousness more likely. So that's a biological explanation. And actually, vitamin B6 affects these levels. And psychologically, um, being open-minded um, makes someone... Um, more likely to have a lucid dream. However, agreeableness does not, and that makes sense because if you're kind of ready to accept any situation as true or be very agreeable, um, you're not going to be, you're not going to recognize, oh, this is um, out of the ordinary, I must be in a dream as often. And being very observant and mindful, of course, of your surroundings, because if you can notice that something is off, you're going to notice you're in a dream. So this attention to your present state, as I said before, and better recognizing that you're in a dream. So who can learn to lucid dream? <coughs> so the answer is anyone. Um, and really the fundamental question of becoming conscious in a dream is this. Pause to ask yourself right now, am I dreaming or awake? Be serious, try to answer the question to the best of your ability and be able to justify why. Now you might say, well, I know I'm not in a dream because, well, I just know. How can you really know? Because when you're in a dream, you sit and you think, I'm in a, I know I'm not in a dream because I can feel this and I can feel that. But the truth is, 
a lot of the things that happen and you feel in a dream are very similar to when you're awake. And being able to stop yourself and ask that question and really be able to answer it in depth is what is going to make you more likely to become aware in dreams and make your brain ask that question in a dream. So some simple techniques you could actually use to try to become conscious in dreams are dream journaling. Um, as I said before, that improves recall. So um, it can help you become more aware of your dreams, repeated mantras, tell yourself, um, am I dreaming? Am I dreaming? And you actually think about it throughout the day. Well, then you're more likely to ask that of yourself in a dream. Action-based reality checks. This is something that's very important. Um, so um, throughout the day, you can try to do simple reality checks that will, will physically show you if you're in a dream. This can be breathing. Actually, in a dream, if you close your mouth and nose, you're still going to be able to dream, uh, breathe. Um, you can actually try to press your fingers through your palm. And in a dream, most likely your fingers, um, not that it's painful, but it's actually, um, it's actually very probable that in dreams, your fingers go right through your palms. <laughs> I don't really know why, but it's actually an odd phenomena. And reading words, words often scramble when you're um, in a dream just because um, your mind is in a different state. And mirrors, often if you look at yourself in the mirror, your image will be distorted or different somehow. And once again, asking yourself consistently, am I dreaming? So there's a few professional, um, more intensive techniques. I won't go into them in too much detail. I'll just kind of um, summarize these. So um, really this, these are based on waking up, trying to wake yourself up during a REM period and then try to fall back to sleep, but maintain consciousness. Um, um, so some of these um, have to do with um, just trying to lie still, let your body fall asleep while your mind stays awake. Um, however, this can lead to sleep paralysis and some other things. So these are definitely more intensive things that um, more um, doctors might use for patients who need to use, um, who need to get to consciousness in dreams. Another technique is using fingers. Similarly, when you wake up in the middle of REM sleep, as you're falling asleep, you um, kind of think about moving your fingers. And just that little action can actually kind of keep your mind awake as you're falling asleep. Keep that consciousness. So um, I actually did some of my own personal study of trying to become more lucid in dreams. Um, I began to use a dream journal. Um, I did more reality checks. So... I actually tried to tie this to um, walking through doorways. So every time I walk in a doorway, I would try to like, think to myself, am I dreaming? Or try to do one of these simple reality checks. And the results actually, um, I was able to become conscious in um, a few dreams. Um, it's not something that happens every single time because it is very variable and it's hard to train your dream. But one of the times I remember becoming conscious, um, I, I knew it was a dream because I had looked in a mirror and I saw my hair was so long. And at first I thought to myself, oh, Yes, I finally grew out my hair. And then I thought, well, wait a second. My hair is not that long. I must be dreaming. And that's how I came to consciousness. So stabilizing the dream is an important thing. Some people, the moment they realize that they are in a dream, they become conscious. They actually, um, the dream ends just because of that excitement um, and that realization. So some techniques that you can use um, are actually spinning in a circle or like wriggling your fingers um, as a dream self. And it just helps you. Um, keep that dream stabilized. And I, and I, I use that technique. Um, I've used that a few times um, when I first came to consciousness. And I, I remember, um, now this has only happened like three times um, about in my um, dream journaling journey, but um, I remember one time coming um, to consciousness in an antique shop and I thought, whoa, I finally, I'm in lucid in a dream, but um, immediately became fuzzy. And so I used one of these techniques and then um, the dream really becomes so crisp right after that. And becoming conscious in a dream um, actually can help you remember them more as well. So some more advanced things, people have actually talked about being able to um, control their dreams, um, which is actually amazing. And uh, the first time you think about it, it may be a little silly actually to think, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in a dream controlling everything. That It's a little bit of a weird thought, but it's actually very true. And if you become um, very good at it, you can make objects appear by visualizing them kind of behind you and convincing it's all about convincing yourself your subconscious that it's true and then um, they can appear or um, one technique that is used in um, nightmare gene therapy is um, actually facing um, the objects or the people in your nightmares and saying things like oh you were going to stop fighting me or you were going to stop chasing me right and just that act of um, assuming makes your subconscious actually switch and oftentimes these um, scary characters will um, kind of follow what you are suggesting they do, which is very interesting. And of course, flying um, is the big thing that people always talk about doing in dreams. So um, 
it would be something you could achieve through lucidity of making these jetpacks appear and then flying through the sky and traveling too, um, creating doorways and just going to different places. Um, so there's this element of fun um, in lucid dreaming when you can do um, cool things and just experience the world or your own imaginary world. Imagine, um, but there's also a more serious aspect, which I'll talk about um, after this. So uh, I call this the X game stage. Um, so these are some more intense things that um, actually some um, people do as dream therapy, um, such as um, asking your subconscious profound questions. You can actually, some people have reported making physical people that represent their subconscious or their themselves and they can ask them questions, which is very interesting. Um, I've never done that. I have not gotten near that point. Um, but it is something that could be possible. Facing fears, um, fear simulations in a safe environment is something that would definitely be possible. Um, the one warning that I saw, um, lucid dreaming is not dangerous at all. However, many people say the thing you should never ever do is um, ask, your, ask your mind to show you um, your deepest fear. Because remember, these are the depths of your mind, so they do know, your mind would know exactly what you are afraid of. So lucid dreaming can do many things. You can take control, alter dream sequences, um, make more vivid dreamscapes, um, explore new places, fly, um, go on adventures. So there's all these cool things you can do. Um, but there's also, there's importance to it. You can improve your dream recall, which means you can have better psychoanalysis. You, you can remember more. You can remember more details. In addition, there's a lot of therapeutic opportunities that can be used with this. And um, really eliminating PTSD or um, nightmares from PTSD, which I'll talk about in a second. So one dream I had, which was actually very interesting, of getting over a nightmare. Um, this one specifically, once again, this is an, uh, a little bit of a negative dream, but um, I find that sometimes negative dreams show um, a little bit more of a depth of um, things that I'm experiencing in my life that are challenging. So sometimes I Think that they are able to help me more and understand myself more. So in this particular dream, I was in my house. Um, it was nighttime, um, so it was a little bit dark. I was alone, and the oddest part is that there were gravestones just outside in my yard, and I had no idea why, but they were kind of creepy to me. And um, actually, during this, um, uh, during this dream, and I don't remember at which point, but I came to consciousness. So I knew it was a dream. Um, I knew everything was fake, but I, I still felt that fear. And so I tried to, um, I, I actually attempted to make it daylight outside again, um, which worked temporarily, but really not well. Um, altering dreams is a very tough thing because it's, it's a mental game. And um, so I, I remember thinking to myself, okay, well, this is just a dream. So I'm not going to let this nightmare scare me. I'm not going to let it um, take over. So I'm going to face my fear. And um, in that moment, um, the way I thought about doing that was actually walking outside to these gravestones. And in my mind, I was like, well, gravestones represent people who've passed away. So how could I face this and just kind of confront this? Well, I'm going to kneel down and pray for the people who have died, or who died in these tombstones, which seems like kind of a fickle, simple idea. But um, in that um, dream state, it kind of made sense um, for some reason. And actually what ended up happening is once I faced that fear and I kind of recognized this is just a dream, it's not real. Um, right away that nightmare went away and the um, the intimidating parts of that dream um, those tombstones really faded away so that really shows how you can use um, lucid dreaming as um, a kind of nightmare therapy and um, similarly these are used often um, in nightmare treatment for PTSD and anxiety um, for um, people returning from war so for veterans um, if they're having these dreams returning to these um, situations that made them so scared um, they can become lucid and resolve and kind of re-script these things that are happening to them and hopefully improve their waking life because of it. Um, you can use mental rehearsals. So you can practice in dreams. Um, you can actually train. Um, um, you can actually train your muscle memory, as you might say. Um, there's been studies that prove that doing something in a dream, uh, practicing an instrument, practicing a sport, actually will make you better at it in real life. Or you could rehearse your capstone presentation, <laughs> which I did not do, but I, I suppose it would be a possibility. And you could also do, have creative exploration, so visualization of ideas, or just exploring new places. So um, the last thing I want to do is just return back to this quote. Um, the key to growth is the introduction of a higher level of consciousness into our awareness. So um, really being aware of our dreams, um, even becoming literally more conscious in them through lucid dreaming can help us achieve more balance. Um, it can help us um, better understand ourselves and our mind. We're better connected to who we are. 
and we become more mindful, happier people who are just aware of our surroundings. Um, and this, um, in this busy world, we can slow down a little bit and learn more about ourselves and understand ourselves more and become more conscious about our dreams so we can become more conscious about our life and who we are outside of our dreams. So that is it. Nice job, Ella. Really well done. Thank you. I'm going to open up the chat to our audience um, to make comments and questions. I think we have one from Mr. Maseni. I can't stop smiling. This is fabulous. But then again, there's oh. nothing that you do that is not fabulous. Nice oh, job Mr. being here. I didn't know Mr. Maseni was here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming, Mr. Maseni. <laughs> Um, Adela said, nice job. Thank you, Adela. Yeah, I'm just really impressed with your thoroughness in the project and your thoroughness in all of your research and everything that um, you brought together here. It's, it's just more than impressive. Thank um, you. I had, I had so much I wanted to talk about. I know it was a bit long, but I, I'm very excited by the topic. So No, it was great. Um, the piece about the 50% of dreams, um, are forgotten within five minutes. That makes so much sense because mm -hmm. just kind of thinking back, and I'm sure a lot of people can speak to this, that you really can't remember your, your dreams. Um, no. and the journaling piece that makes a lot of sense in terms of just journaling and writing down. And it sounds like the lucid dreams sort of allow you to be a little bit more mindful. Mm -hmm. Um, What's the process of getting into a lucid dream? Is there a certain place you need to be? Like, how, how does it work? Yeah, so it definitely can vary. So on one, there's two, um, really two ways that you can enter a lucid dream. One um, is, is already being in the dream and just noticing something that makes you know it's something is off. So for example, when I looked into the mirror, I saw my hair was long and I knew, well, my hair is not that long. And that's, that's a challenging thing to do because oftentimes, as I said, that part of our brain that has long-term memory is shut off when we're dreaming. Um, so we kind of accept everything as reality when it's not. But that's why those techniques of doing repeated mantras in your daily life or doing um, even daily reality checks and thinking throughout the day, am I dreaming? Um, why do I know I'm not dreaming? Can train your mind so that in a dream suddenly you might... Um, you might have that same thought to think, well, am I in a dream? And then you're going to look around yourself um, and you might recognize something that tells you um, that you're dreaming and that's the moment that you would come to consciousness. And then the other, um, the other it's a little bit tougher to do this, but um, these are more of the professional techniques that um, a psychologist might use to treat someone um, using um, nightmare therapy. Um, getting them to lucidity is um, actually waking yourself up or in the middle of the night, um, usually around 4 a.m. or when you're in the middle of REM sleep so that you wake right up from that, and then you um, really focus on as you're going to sleep, um, you have to keep your mind awake. So you can, sometimes you can literally feel um, yourself falling asleep, but your mind is awake, and you literally, you, you, would, you would transition right into that dream. Um, and um, that I have never done, just because um, it's very hard to keep that consciousness, because normally you, your brain falls asleep when your body does. Um, but that's, that's probably the most direct and most... Um, I guess the most successful way if you're able to do it correctly. Makes sense. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, we have a couple other comments, questions here from Susan Merkel Ward. Great job. I was wondering if there's a connection between different types of brain injuries and dreaming. Do people with certain mm -hmm. brain injuries dream differently or less more? Not sure if this part is part of your research, but just curious. Yeah, so I haven't done specific, um, I haven't researched that specifically, but I, uh, from what I have learned, I think I could answer that a little bit. So there's a lot of parts of the brain that um, add, that kind of contribute to the dream content. So as um, you saw in that diagram of um, the, um, the amygdala and the thalamus, like all of that stuff, um, those, if, if one of those parts are hurt or somehow hindered, it's going to change completely what you dream about. Um, and the one thing I will know, um, I did um, read about people who have some um, some mental um, issues such as, um, well, for example, people who are murderers or have kind of these um, psychotic um, problems going on in their mind tend to have um, a lot less dreams, which is very interesting. Um, it's hard, of course, to know because so we, we don't remember many of our dreams anyhow, but um, that the frequency of dreams is affected by things like that. So I would definitely say that having other parts of your brain impaired would affect whom you're dreaming.
Sorry, I was on mute, I didn't realize. Um, one more comment here from Holly Starkman. It was an absolute pleasure to mentor Ella on this capstone, which she worked on independently and with exceptional curiosity and advanced skill level overall. Well done, Ella. Thank you. I think we can all echo that. Really nice job. So tell us, what are next steps for you? Do you plan to continue this research next year at college or do you have any plans regarding this? Yeah, well, so I have always been interested in going into some sort of um, medicine. And so, um, and specifically, I was interested in neuroscience, but this has actually made me very interested in psychology as well. Um, so I think it's expanded my horizons and options of what I do want to study eventually. And um, so, yeah, I think I want to carry this on and um, definitely take some more classes on this subject. And I could definitely see it being something that affects um, my future career. Awesome. Well, we wish you the best of luck with your future work and really nice job. I'm so glad that you decided to do a capstone project and um, really well done tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I think that concludes our presentations for tonight. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, we will have some more next week for those of you who can join us. Um, and I wish everyone a great night.